Welcome to Rick's Corner, brought to you by Old School Labs, the brand I trust and the only one I put my name to. Use my code, Drayson12, on the link below. Welcome to Rick's Corner. The man, the myth, the legend. Now on with the show. Welcome to Rick's Corner. My guest today, you've probably seen him around 180 films, maybe? And, films and television. And show. television. Yeah. And he's always the bad guy, but he's really a good guy. And it's really my honor that he showed up, came over here, Patrick Kilpatrick, and it's really nice of you to do this for me. My pleasure to be here. Really good. I've seen you many, many times. Well, thanks. I've been lucky to do a fair amount of work the last but, 30 But, years. it goes beyond that. You started out as a, a, in marketing for writing and um, magazines? Yeah, I went to New York after university, and I um, I very quickly went up in the advertising world. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, I was very lucky. I fell into a type of advertising where, like Life Magazine, would hire me uh, um, and to do ad campaigns for the magazine itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, along the line, I did advertising for fashion entities and. Uh, and, I, and then I began doing journalism for those magazines as a side thing because I admired Hunter Thompson and some other journalists of the time. And, and so that's what I did for pretty close to 13 years. And you were good at writing. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I talk about in the book, um, it, coming up with new words and metaphors and things like that were, yeah. um, it was an easy way for me to get... Um, praise from my parents. Um, my mother had been a teacher and was for most of her career. And yeah. They really prized education. So, uh, and, and also, they wouldn't really let me watch television, so I read like a book a day. And so, uh, and my earliest heroes were writers and, and uh, the, either that or the characters in their books. Yeah. So I, uh, um, I was heavily influenced by that. I never intended to become an actor. Well, I want to get to that. But but writing, I, I've written for Huffington Post and a lot of magazines on nutrition. And I always, in school, did not like English. I did not like math. And I did not like history. And then I ended up doing it all as I got older. And now yeah. I appreciate it. Well, I adored history and, and languages and English. was never very good at math. The only time I got good at math was when I started doing... Um, Distribution figures for films and television well, okay, shows. but, but basic math, but, uh, uh, algebra. Yeah. Just I had no idea what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I was I, I did the basic requirements to get out of uh, college and the University of Richmond and math one hundred and one and or I think one hundred and five. It was called, and that was it. Yeah, and you worked for the government. I've never worked for the government. You did no. something with the. I was a bodyguard. Is that not what? Before you're... that, like an ambassador or something like that, I read on your Wikipedia. Um, oh, I do a lot of foreign film and media. Um, that's what it was. Not only um, teaching entertainment, but also organizing film schools for mm -hmm. foreign countries. That's what it was. Um, much of which came out of. Um, film development and looking for different locations to um, to film uh, projects, uh, either where there was incentives or other uh, reasons to go to a, a distant location. So, um, kind of as an offshoot of that, I ended up doing. I, I was a founder of, uh, as part of the deal, I was a founder of the University of Pacific. Film and theater school um, in Fiji, and um, so I s developed a, an expertise for. I mean, really, it's producing in its essence, which is really making deals to yeah. make it happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, we f uh, found uh, I if we made a connection with the university, we could. Um, you know, pull top students to be interns on the film productions and then um, they got some real uh, world experience working with top professionals and um, and the university would have a, a program they didn't have a film uh, program at the time or theater program and so I've ended up doing some of that for Brazil right now we're involved with Nigeria uh, <clears throat> 
maybe setting up an academy in uh, Nigeria right now. So most people you probably know from whatever realm they're in, they reach a point where they do want to give back. Right. And teaching becomes a natural outgrowth. Right. In the case of going to some of these foreign um, countries, uh, it's it's a, a lark and a, a, an adventure for them, uh, and uh, you know you take a person who's working for Spielberg and maybe they're getting ten grand a week doing whatever they're doing, but. Uh, at some point, they want to teach and uh, maybe take their families that they don't have enough time to spend with to some place like Nigeria sure. or Fiji for an adventure and do an eight-week program or something like well, that. Well, teaching also validates what you already know and you end up learning more by giving. Well, there's no question about that. As an entertainment teacher and acting coach and all of that, I've learned a lot of stuff and it kind of reinforces basics and yes. new stuff that you need to be doing all the time. I got into acting teaching originally because I would be auditioning literally thousands of actors for a film and uh, people would come in and just do the craziest stuff. And I'd go, well, why did you do that? And they'd go, well, my acting coach or my acting teacher told me to do that. Yeah. And I'm like, there is no way you're going to get employed yeah. uh, that way. So uh, I, I began a mentorship program through my film company that we, we take young people. It's all about working. Um, get What do we need to do to remove the blocks so you can be working mm -hmm. as rapidly as possible? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's assuming that they have the drive and the, the self-discipline to do it because it's not rocket science, but it is creative and you have to, uh, particularly for acting, it's centered around auditioning. Um, also for me, as having been a writer and a creative person before I was an actor, um, it's a cross-disciplinary approach. Every actor needs to be writing, directing, and producing, mm -hmm. and every producer needs to know about directing, acting, and, and writing, mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa. So we get people to be masterful auditioners and then also get them creating their own content. Um, and uh, not that many people have taken the time to, to sort of know and hopefully unarrogantly, humbly, I say master the different, the multitude of skill sets that's necessary from sort of idea inception all the way to global return. Yeah, There's many places where of course you can just get ripped off completely and not succeed. So, There's so many people out here that, that, that what do you, oh yeah, see them in Starbucks, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm an actor, but they're not getting any work. And I don't know yeah. if they even get on auditions and, and agents nowadays are like, I don't know, you've got to know somebody that knows somebody that knows you. Well, it's particularly the business has, has transformed uh, for good and for ill uh, since I began. Um, it's very rare now where you actually get into a room with the director and the producer. Yeah. It's all self tapings yeah. and three or four thousand submissions to every job. So every audition that you get is a miracle. Uh, it, just in itself, and you better bang that down and be so good that, wow, maybe we're not going to give him that job, but we're going to create something yeah. uh, for them down the road. Um, it's always been if you didn't really know how to audition. The only other alternative is, say, like a guy like De Niro, who was, by all accounts, a terrible auditioner um, and extremely shy, but of course he he tied up with Martin Scorsese, you know, and, yeah. and was able to bring his acting skills to bear. But uh, if you don't know certain things, and you're absolutely right, actors, uh, entertainment people in general, when they begin, even advertising people, whatever endeavor, you're kind of wandering in the wilderness, mm -hmm. and you can literally waste decades oh, if yeah. you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so. We try to eradicate that in, uh, wilderness. Well, years ago, your agent submitted you. They sent a headshot. They called you in for an audition, and you did your thing today. Is like I could use this camera and I could send in an audition reel just real quick. Yeah. But how many do they get, and how many do they actually look at? You know, I don't know. The good news about self tapings and things like that is you can repeat it until you get it where the way you want it. Right. The bad news is there's certain. Hard to define things about presence and um, 
that come through only when you're in the room with the decision maker. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, it's just the way of the world. Though. Well, how did you get into the acting part of it? Well, I, I ended up at Time Incorporated, uh, really, which was the pinnacle of that advertising realm and magazines. And um, I, I did it for a while there, and I, I, I helped relaunch Life Magazine. And, and uh, the truth was, I, I got bored. I'd, I'd done it, you know, I'd done that. And real writers, to me, wrote novels mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. So I, to save money, I took a sabbatical from Time, Inc., and moved up to Connecticut and split a house with an actor who was becoming a huge Broadway director, a guy named John Tillinger. This is still very active. And um, I, I ended up, uh, he hired me for 200 bucks a month to babysit his kids, write my novel, while he went to do this play at Williamstown Theater Festival, which your audience may not know is kind of summer camp for theatrics for big time New York Eastern actors like Bly Danner and Richard Dreyfuss and Christopher Reeves and mm -hmm. Frank Langella. So I went up there and I got fascinated by it. So instead of a novel, I wrote a play and the play got produced. Then I was asked to join theater companies as the, it's called the literary manager, mm -hmm. the guy who selects the plays. Mm -hmm. And it was just natural. I was a big physical guy and, uh, and, um, could speak pretty well at that juncture. Um, and so uh, I, I began filling in in acting roles, and it just kind of took off. Yeah, you've done a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was meant to be. Um, it really was. What, what, how about the bodyguard with the uh, rock groups? Well, when I got to, out of university, I went to New York, and my uh, girlfriend, later my uh, my first wife, it's a tell a tellingly revealing statement there, but <laughs> um, uh, sh her best friend's boyfriend was a guy who was in charge of putting together a, a team uh, to provide bodyguarding and security services for rock concerts, because at that time, rock uh, audiences didn't really like having police around. Yeah. And so... I became member of about a nine-man team uh, of guys who did bodyguarding for rock groups and on-stage security and stuff, and it was mostly um, off-season New York Jets guys. Yeah. In fact, I was like the second smallest guy. Um, and, and you're not small. No, um, I'm about two twenty and and uh, six two and. But it was fabulous to do. I mean, I made a lot of money. I was working uh, then as a writer during the day and making about seven thousand dollars a year uh, in salary for some places and some freelance gigs, and at the same time making a lot of money as a. But it became very violent. Mm -hmm. It became really. But I had the privilege of being, you know, up close and uh, to some of the greatest music of all times, you know, the people like Rod Stewart and yeah. Humble Pie and Jimi Hendrix and uh, Procol Harum and Grateful Dead and Elvis, uh, all kinds of people. And whenever they came to New York, we would do that. So That's we amazing. did it on Long Island in New York. And uh, it was pretty epic. But when people started getting shotgunned to death, <laughs> uh, and eventually the police had to get involved yeah. came back in and, and uh, but it was a wild time what would you say uh, and you've done a lot of films or some of your favorites first five well they're always for different reasons clearly uh, working with Steven Spielberg and Minority Report was a great job I call it a true Hollywood moment and I've had a couple of those my agent just called and said come on over and I thought I'd gotten done something terrible and, and <laughs> So uh, I came over, he says, Steven Spielberg has hired you for four months. And I didn't even audition for him. He just really? saw me in a show. I didn't even meet him. And so uh, that was pretty awesome. Uh, but, you know, uh, these big studio movies often are not nearly as much fun as a smaller independent thing because you get to do so much and it's under such compressed 
time frames that yes. you know you do a low budget film and five minutes after you're there you're doing an Irish dialect and you're shooting weapons and, and doing your own stunts with a car and so but top five Minority Report was awesome uh, Death Warrant with Jean-Claude, which seems to be the, such an enduring thing that I'm known for as the Sandman. Um, uh, I've had some tremendous emotional creative moments in very, very small movies. Um, uh, I can't, I, you know, after a while I've done so many, you I forget. can't remember. You know, every job, people go, which job do you like the most? And the truth is, they're like children. I've loved all of them, and every one of them had different reasons of course. To, to like. You've worked with Arnold. I did. I did a racer with Arnold. Yeah, I trained with him for four years. Very. I, I enjoyed the experience of working with him. He's a lot. great guy. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of, of fun. fun. A lot of fun back in those days. I had yeah. a good time with him. Um, I've only seen him rarely uh, since then, but I also, in the same movie, Vanessa Williams was awesome uh, to work with. I've worked with her a couple of times on Boomtown and Eraser. Um, <clears throat> that was Chuck Russell. Um, but that's the example. Eraser's a sample of you're such a small element to um, 500 people who are operating yeah. that literally. Um, what I did in Eraser, if you were guest starring on a television show, they would do it in about a day and a half. Mm -hmm. But they were I had the, they had me on Eraser for seven weeks. Oh my god! So you make a lot of money. Yeah. But you're sitting around a lot. Yeah. And um, uh, even if you've got a, a lead part, as I did, or in Minority Report, you know, you, the impulse becomes, please, Stephen. Or in that case, Chuck Russell, uh, what else can I do? <laughs> or can I go home now? <laughs> what, uh, no, uh, what I do is I'd bring my computer in and I'd write. Yeah. Or, um, you know, you might get in trouble bird-dogging chicks or throwing yeah. a baseball through a window while you're playing catch or something. Yeah. Or, but I'd read a lot of books. But also, I, as I got into production, I would bring my whole operation into the set. You worked on Criminal Minds. Great job. Uh, yeah, I did. With Mandy Potemkin. Good show. Uh, it was a good show, and it was a really great character based on the Iceman, uh, who's a real guy who killed about 250 yeah. people. Um, uh, really informative. Working with Mandy was really great. You know, we... Uh, he said something very profound when I was doing it. He said, like, we're, I was a serial killer, obviously, and he, uh, he said, uh, it's just a conversation. And in fact, that's the truth. Yeah. You know, anybody can be a serial killer. Yeah. We have this notion that evil people are like, ooh, ooh, you know, yeah. they're not. Sometimes they're en enormously boring. If you watch the news and somebody does something, he was such a nice neighbor. Yeah, yeah That's exactly. a nice guy. We never would have thought anything would have happened. So now you have a book out. I do. Uh, in fact, I'm about to set out volume two. Um, What's it about? Well... I think I had a very privileged upbringing and a very unique upbringing in a lot of ways. I think everybody has a tale to tell, but my mother, uh, who was an extraordinary woman, uh, and my father was an extraordinary guy. My father was an underwater demolition team guy in World War II, uh, was a nationally renowned baseball player, struck out George Bush to win the National Collegiate Baseball Championship, World War II Silver Star recipient, Purple Heart. A member of this underwater demolition team, who's the precursors to the Navy SEALs, mm -hmm. landed on every beach in the Pacific just about um, before the Marines. And and then he came out and was offered a, a contract, won the National Collegiate Baseball Championship, uh, striking out George Bush in 1949, and then was offered a contract to pitch the Yankees turned it down because my mother said she wouldn't marry him if he became a baseball player and he founded Cigna Corporation yeah. uh, which is a huge healthcare company yes. he's an extraordinary guy he was 6 foot 6 250 pounds and uh, just great athlete and scholar and accomplished guy from day one till he passed away uh, my mother uh, same thing but, but I think I mean I'm not a psychiatrist or clinical doctor but best I can discern is she was severely bipolar and so highly irrational sometimes volatile uh, violent um, uh, very rigid in a lot of ways devoted to education which I certainly got 
but it, it made for a very almost uh, uh, we weren't wealthy because my father was on the way up but we had animals and horses and extraordinary food and my mother was this great cook and so it was an education it was this privileged upbringing at the same time marred by this sort of war zone yeah. of uh, with my mother's illness and um, so there was that and then going into New York and the uh, writing aspect I ended up with a manuscript I wanted to write that anyway because frankly whenever people tell stories I would always have a story that would top the person who I was talking to I don't care what it was and that began to make me feel bad because I didn't really want to put down not yeah. put down but supersede you other want to people's be one stories. Up on them. Yeah, so I said, i got to find a repository for these stories. And so uh, I began to write, and at the time I was courting a woman who's now my wife, and so I would send her a chapter a week, and I ended up with a draft, and, and uh, uh, then it was picked up by a big-time literary uh, agent, and um, uh, Joel Gottler at Intellectual Property Group, and, and uh, I... Uh, I spent some time in the New York publishing world with that, and um, but I ended up with a manuscript that was 600 pages. So I felt that was too much for one book. It's a lot, and so yeah, that's like Norman Mailer. <laughs> so anyway, I cut it in half and made it two books. The first one came out last October, and and uh, I've been beating around the country on book tour. So when it says dying for a living. Hold that up. Yes, means it's swirling across the screen. As you were getting killed in every show. Well, it refers to that too, but also I was a particular kind of a personality that was really into gobbling every second of uh, of, of life. Uh, my earliest heroes, like I said, the literary guys, were people who did that, and so I. Uh, the dying for living refers to an exuberance as much as trying to figure out how I really ended up playing all these villains, uh, which I had to, I, after re writing that whole volume one I and it being published, I then I suddenly remembered that in first grade, uh, my school did a play, and I was made the villain in first grade. Really? So it they started just through. Huh? Whatever it was, the energy uh, yeah. carried. It started really young. You know, like even on uh, athletic teams, like I was, I would be the monster man on the football team. You know, could go anywhere and wreak havoc wherever I wanted. So and I had a particular energy, and uh, and I was very physical. And uh, so, and you know, some of it is institutional typecasting, of course. Yeah, yeah. In Hollywood, if you do anything well, they're going to pigeonhole you. Well, they did Which that. brings up uh, the Irishman. Yes. You know, it's like, I guess it's an easy finance for Martin Scorsese to do something on, uh, you know, organized crime. Sure. I mean, it's, it's his know. thing. Yeah. It's the same thing when I started, when I was back in the day, streaming with Arnold, they called for bodybuilders and we all went out and I said, can we do something beside that? No, we want you to play this role because you're a bodybuilder. Well, but why can't I be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that and wear a smock? Well, it wouldn't look right, but nowadays... Well, I never better. played a journalist and I was a journalist and a writer. Yeah. Um, you think things change with age though? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, they've changed. Instead of being the corrupt maniac corporal, I've become the corrupt maniac general. <laughs> uh, uh, things do change, you know, instead of the thug beating everybody up, you become the mob boss, and uh, you can send other guys <laughs> to do it. But do they change fundamentally? Only if uh, you really... Um, Turned down work left, right, and center. I was always into working left, right, and I had a family, and I really wanted to keep working. But if I had that to do over, um, I, I think I would. I don't know what I do because you know my feeling through that was if I keep doing this, they'll, they'll somebody else will come up. Don't get me wrong; it's rich acting turf, and all these people are different. Yeah. yeah. But. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, you take a guy like Rutger Hauer, you know, he did such a good job on The Hitcher that it was very difficult for him to get out of the villain thing yeah, after yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, he eventually sort of evolved to playing heavy wizards and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, he was great in The Hitcher. Yeah, yeah.
Well, where can uh, people Wonderful find you and the book if they want to buy the book? Uh, the book is readily available at Amazon.com and Barnes and Nobles. Amazon uh, in all its forms, hardcore, okay, uh, hardcover and paperback and Audible and Kindle and uh, same with Barnes and Nobles. If they want an autographed copy and they haven't uh, the opportunity to get to one of the signings, then they can go to PatrickKillPatrick.com. Yeah, that's your, I'll put that up on the website. Yeah, PatrickKillPatrick.com and happy to have them do that. Uh, also, uh, a percentage of this goes to the Disabled Veterans of America. Oh, great. And uh, so... Um, well, I'm going to post that, and I'm also going to post some pictures of some of your roles, because I can get those off the internet. Sure, it sounds great. You a bad guy you really are. Anything you need. I've got a wonderful creative IT and graphic guy named Greg Forrest who works with me all the time. And this is volume one, and volume two, this is called Sins and Confessions of a Hollywood Villain and Libertine Patriot, and volume two is called Wasted Talent in the Valley of Debacle. <laughs> and that's dying for a living too, and that'll be that's all show business all the time. Yeah. So uh, although there's a lot of Hollywood stuff in this one. Well thank you very much for taking time to come over here. My pleasure. It really God it, bless you. It meant a lot to me and um this is great. I just learned so much right now. Well you've got a really great persona. Well thank you. Yeah yeah. Like my mom. I mean I would I see Ca visionary casting people and yeah. directors will cast people out of type. I was just watching Once Upon a Time in the West. You know, it's Henry Fonda playing one of the great villains of all times, which was against type. Yeah. So you you really uh, I could I I I, I uh, by the way I just want to mention Catalyst in which I play a, a, a pedophile priest is coming out, and also Nightwalk, yeah. uh, which is a sort of Romeo and Juliet. And, uh, Western journalist meets Islam beauty. That's that's, yeah, that's good stuff. Man. Next time you do a, a production and you're going to cast it, and you need a guy sitting by the little creek feeding pigeons for the older guys, I can do that. I'm sure you can. You see, you, we won't need a stunt uh, <laughs> pigeon feeder. Maybe by then. <laughs> I'm sure you can do a lot of things. You know, most of the acting is from here to yes. here. So even as we get uh, uh, older, we can assemble all of that. Yeah, I, I have parts around. <laughs> I have to check the house and put them all together just to get out of the house in the morning. I'm sure you'll be fine. But thank you so much. Thank you for thank watching you. this corner, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Hope you enjoyed the video brought to you by Old School Labs. Use my discount code Grayson12 on the link below at OldSchoolLabs.com. Hey everyone, now you can have the Gold's Gym logo drawn by me, the artist Rick Grayson, personalized and made out to you and signed by me to frame and put on your gym wall or wherever you see fit to do so. It's a piece of bodybuilding history. It will never be duplicated again. It's the largest selling icon t-shirt logo in the world. And I'm the guy that drew it. And I will draw it for you. Just go to my website, rickdrayson.com, and order there. You can pay through PayPal, and it'll be sent out right away. And be sure to watch Rick's Corner for all the videos on bodybuilding, nutrition, fitness, pro wrestling, and anything that suits your interests as far as getting physically fit and being the best you can be from the golden era of bodybuilding. Baby, see you next time.